Welcome to today's New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. At this time, we ask that cell phones please be on silent or vibrate. If you wish to testify today, you can come up to the sergeant's desk and fill out one of these slips over here. Um, written testimony can be sent to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. I'm going to first turn it over uh, to our speaker of the City Council, Adrian Adams, for our opening statement. Thank you, Chair Krishnan, and good morning, everyone. I'm Speaker Adrian Adams, and I'd like again to thank Chair Krishnan for convening this hearing on the Trump Organization's contract at Ferry Point Park. In 2021, the city canceled contracts with the Trump Organization for the Woman and Lasca Rinks and the Central Park Carousel. As it happens, I was actually a member of the Council's Committee on Parks when those cancellations were proposed by the previous administration. This is unfinished council business. The city should now also do the same for the contract at Ferry Point Park. The Trump Organization is not suited to operate the golf course at Ferry Point Park because of criminal convictions against and allegations related to its executive officers. Alan Weisselberg, a named party on the contract with the city and the chief financial officer of the Trump Organization, pled guilty to 15 felony charges related to a financial scheme to evade $1.76 million in taxes due on unreported income. This is in addition to the other criminal and civil investigations that are ongoing by the federal and state prosecutors on the Trump organization itself. These actions should provide a basis for the city to cancel its contract with the Trump Organization for the operation of the golf course at Ferry Point Park. In addition to the Trump Organization's activities, this past weekend we remembered those who were lost during 9-11. And for those of us that were here in Midtown Manhattan, in Lower Manhattan, and other places across the city, we will never forget that day. The bipartisan 9-11 Commission, which studied the attack in its aftermath, cited, quote, Saudi Arabia as a problematic ally in combating extremism. The Trump-operated golf course, hosting a golf tournament sponsored by the Saudi government just weeks after the 20, just a week after the 21st anniversary, is insensitive to say the least. For many families who lost loved ones on that fateful day, the days and weeks surrounding it are understandably difficult. The park's permit that was issued for this event should be canceled. The city should divest itself from all contracts with the Trump Organization and immediately revoke the permit that was issued for the Aramco Team Series event at Ferry Point Park. I do look forward to the testimony from the New York City Parks Department regarding this contract and hearing from the families affected by 9-11. Once again, New York City will never forget the horror of 9-11. The city of New York should never participate in joining or co-joining with anything that brings financial gain to the Trump Organization, particularly when it pertains to 9-11. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Speaker Adams. Good morning, everyone. I'm Shaker Krishnan, Chair of the Committee on Parks and Recreation in our New York City Council. And I'd like to welcome all of you to today's hearing, where we will examine the city's contract with the Trump Organization to run the golf course at Ferry Point Park in the Bronx. I'd like to take a second to also personally thank and welcome Speaker Adams for appearing today with the Parks Committee for this hearing. The speaker has been steadfast in her desire to see that those entities that the city does business with are entities that provide a benefit to the people of the city and conduct their businesses in an honorable way. Now, as the speaker said, 
I was also looking forward to the Parks Commissioner or representatives of City Hall attending today's hearing. However, we were informed late last night that Parks Commissioner Donahue nor any City Hall representatives would appear for today's hearing. No reason was given. And that raises serious concerns and questions for all of us. Because if City Hall and its agencies make a decision, the agencies or the representatives of City Hall show up to defend their decisions. As we've seen in hearing after hearing for this committee, for other committees of the council, and as we will see for future hearings as well. So it makes the absence of anyone from the administration even more appalling. Because it means that this decision is indefensible. And that is why no one is here today from the Parks Department or from City Hall to defend this decision and the subject of today's hearing. Dozens of the mayor's senior staff sit not one minute away from this chamber. The Parks Commissioner and Parks Representatives have appeared for numerous hearings and will appear going forward. But this administration could not send a single person to explain to New Yorkers why City Hall has handed over a public park to Donald Trump and his criminal enterprise and still does nothing about it. It raises serious questions, their absence, about their willingness to take action to protect the public interest here. Raises serious questions about their inability to defend the special approval that was required by the Parks Department for this offensive golf tournament and for the continuation of the Parks license for the Trump Organization that is simply unworthy of it. Today's hearing comes at an important moment, a moment that calls us to make good on our words as community leaders, as activists for justice and fairness, and as advocates for the people of the city of New York, a moment that ties decades of September 11th vigils like the ones just a few days ago and years of resistance to Donald Trump into a single decision point. This is a moment where we, this city, can decide to immediately end our ties to Trump and his criminal enterprise. We can ensure that we respect the lives of those who perished on one of the darkest and most tragic days in our cities and our country's history. We can ensure that public parkland is kept in public hands where it belongs and not in the hands of a private enterprise subject to numerous criminal probes and that charges exorbitantly high fees for its use as a public golf course. If we do not act now, this moment will slip away and our city will be complicit in supporting the Trump Organization and its associates in their control over our public parkland and in this offensive tournament, dishonoring the lives we lost on 9-11 and failing to protect our public parkland that continues to be out of reach for so many New Yorkers while it is in the hands of the Trump Organization. During today's hearing, we will examine the various paths available to immediately terminate the Department of Parks and Recreation's license agreement with Trump Ferry Point LLC to operate the golf course at Ferry Point Park. The August 18th guilty plea on 15 felony charges by Alan Weisselberg, the CFO and Executive Vice President of Trump Ferry Point LLC when this license went into effect, with his name appearing in a signature all over the license documents, makes it untenable for the city to continue to do business with this operator. Trump Ferry Point LLC is simply unworthy of a license 
to operate our public parkland. In addition to the long history of the Trump Organization's fraudulent operations, the recently announced plans for the Saudi-backed golf tournament to be held at Ferry Point Park are an affront to the values of New York City. Scheduled for October 13th through 15th, just weeks after the anniversary of the 9-11 tragedy, this event does harm to the families of 9-11 victims and offends the public memory of that horrific day. Beyond the harm to the 9-11 families, the Saudi regime has perpetrated numerous human rights violations and until recently denied women basic rights and dignity. These are the facts and they are not disputed. The agreement is clear as day. The Department of Parks and Recreation's license agreement with Trump Ferry Point LLC for this public golf course is, quote, terminable at will by the Parks Commissioner in her sole and absolute discretion at any time, at any time, end quote, upon 25 days written notice. The Aramco Team Series Golf Tournament is more than one month away. There are substantial grounds to terminate the license agreement immediately. And in doing so, by this Saturday, September 17th, would cancel the offensive golf tournament next month. The grounds are strong. Alan Weisselberg, former chief financial officer of the Trump Organization, is listed as executive vice president and chief financial officer of Trump Ferry Point LLC on their license agreement. On August 18th, in connection with his leadership position of the Trump Organization, Weisselberg pleaded guilty to 15 felony charges, including grand larceny, tax fraud, and falsifying business records. He is required to make full repayment of taxes, penalties, and interest due to the City of New York and the New York State Tax Authorities, totaling $1,994,321. The city's license agreement with Trump Ferry Point LLC requires its employees and agents to comply with all federal, state, and local laws and legal requirements. It is explicit in the license agreement. The Trump Organization remains under criminal investigation and faces criminal charges in Manhattan set to go to trial next month with testimony expected from Weisselberg, who just pled. Specific to the Ferry Point property, there are serious questions about Weisselberg's and the Trump Organization's potential misuse of the public golf course for private benefit, including for a private bat mitzvah reception for Weisselberg's granddaughter, as reported in Vanity Fair in 2019. Donald Trump is listed as the chief executive officer and president of Trump Ferry Point LLC, and the sole guarantor of this license agreement with the Parks Department. He faces multiple pending lawsuits, including civil claims for his incitement of the January 6th insurrection at the Capitol, an ongoing investigation into his and the Trump Organization's financial dealings by New York State Attorney General Letitia James, and an ongoing investigation into his potential criminal violation of the Espionage Act by the FBI. The cloud of legal investigations of the most serious nature surrounding Trump impedes his capacity to serve as guarantor as required by the terms of this license. Further, this golf course is exorbitantly expensive for New Yorkers. The fees for New York City residents are at a minimum $200 for a full round of golf at Trump Ferry Point. Nearby Bethpage Black Golf Course, a public golf course operated by the New York State Park System, has fees of around $65 to $85 for a full round of golf, and previously hosted the most premier tournaments in golf, such as the US Open and PGA Championship. The executive officers of Trump Ferry Point LLC are either convicted of criminal charges or implicated in myriad ongoing civil and criminal legal actions. 
And so the questions are clear. Why are we letting him and his, his associates use our public land, our public park, like this? Especially after the council, as a speaker mentioned, previously called upon this city to renounce and discontinue all its contracts, including other concession licenses with the Trump Organization. Who in this administration or at City Hall approved such an offensive tournament? A tournament that, as the license makes clear, and we will show, required special approval from the city. Further, Trump Ferry Point and the city have partnered with the regime that invokes pain and suffering on families that suffered the most on September 11th. Why should we as a city allow this to continue? We owe it to the people of New York City. We owe it to the survivors of families of 9-11 to fight in every way possible with every tool at our disposal to terminate this license and bring this matter to a close. That is the minimum this administration and this Parks Commissioner could do, is to fight in every way possible to terminate this agreement. Our public parkland should not be in the hands of Donald Trump or his criminal enterprise. Thank you and welcome again. We will now be calling up, with the absence of the administration today, we will now be calling up our first witness, Stephen Younger, attorney and former president of the New York State Bar Association. You may begin, Ms. Younger. Thank you, Speaker Adams, Chair Krishnan, and your fellow council members. My name is Stephen Younger. I'm a partner at Foley Hoag, a law firm with over 300 lawyers. With me today is my colleague, Shayona Cato. And as uh, your chair mentioned, I'm a past president of the New York State Bar Association. I've been practicing law in New York City for over 35 years. I Sorry, regularly- Mr. Younger, can you move the mic a little bit closer to you, if you can? Thanks. Is this better? Yes. Yes. I regularly litigate real estate disputes, including surrounding contracts similar to the Ferry Point license that's in front of you today. I'm also author of the treatise on the New York Commercial Division, which is where disputes like this play out in the court system regularly. I'm a native New Yorker. I grew up playing stickball in our city parks, so I want to thank you for your stewardship of our city parks, which are one of our most valuable assets. My testimony today will address the license agreement, which grants Trump Ferry Point LLC the right to operate a tournament quality golf course at a site in the Bronx, right next to Whitestone Bridge. I will focus on the contract's termination clause and a termination fee that would be due to the Trump entity if that provision were to be invoked. Before I get into the details, allow me to, to emphasize two key takeaways. First, the city's commissioner of parks and recreation can unilaterally terminate this license in her sole discretion, so long as that termination is not arbitrary or capricious. Second, I believe the termination fee that would be owed to the t Trump entity could well be as low as $5 million and it's likely to be less than 10. These are just estimates, and you would need a accounting review to get to the exact number, but it's worth bearing these sorts of estimates in mind today. Let me start with the, the termination clause, which you see up on the, the chart. Section 3.2A of the contract allows the Parks Commissioner to terminate this contract at will. It states, the license agreement is terminable at will by the commissioner in, it says his, but I'll say her, 
sole and absolute discretion at any time. This means the Park Commissioner can terminate this license whenever she wants, at any time. There's just one limiting factor. Any termination at will cannot be arbitrary or capricious. What does that mean? Basically, the commissioner needs to have a sound reason for the termination, which is based on the facts before her. The contracts give two examples for guidance. On the one hand, it would not be arbitrary to terminate the contract to use the land for an alternative park use. On the other hand, it would be arbitrary to terminate simply for the purpose of giving the license to somebody else. In my view, given the circumstances here, it would not be arbitrary to terminate this agreement under Section 3.2a, and here's why. First, Donald Trump, his companies, and various of his associates face several serious criminal investigations. His CFO, Alan Weisselberg, has already pled guilty to numerous felonies, including grand larceny and tax fraud relating to his role at the Trump Organization. Mr. Weisselberg is listed in Section 36 of the contract as one of the contact persons for the Trump entity that manages the golf course, and he serves as a CFO of that entity. Moreover, the Trump Organization is soon headed toward a criminal tax fraud trial here in New York. Mr. Trump himself is the subject of several civil and criminal investigations by this state's attorney general, by the district attorney in Manhattan, by the federal government, and several other states. None of this is news to anyone in this room, nor would it be news to any court that might review a termination of this license. But there's another reason why termination would be appropriate here. The agreement was personally guaranteed by Donald Trump. To support that guarantee, Mr. Trump submitted a signed certification by his then accounting firm, the Weiser Firm. Trump's accountants certified that his net worth was over $3 billion, and thus that his personal guarantee was adequate to support the financial terms of the agreement if that guarantee were to be called. However, early this year, those very same accountants withdrew their statements of Trump's financial position for the period 2011 to 2012, uh, 2020. As a result, the Park Commissioner can reasonably take the position that there's no support for the Trump guarantee of the deal, which was a critical inducement for the city to enter into this license. Given all these circumstances, for the city to sever its ties to Mr. Trump and his company does not appear to be arbitrary or capricious. Now, once the commissioner gives notice of an at-will termination, such a termination takes effect in 25 days. In other words, if the termination were invoked today, Trump's license for the golf course would terminate on October 10, 2022, next month. When the license is terminated, Section 3.2B of the contract grants Trump Ferry Point LLC, which is the entity that runs the course, a termination fee. That fee is intended to reimburse the Trump Organization for funds that they invested in the project. Now, Section 3.2b spells out how this termination fee is to be calculated. There are four basic components to the calculation. The fee amounts to Trump's capital improvement costs, plus what are called growing costs, minus amortization, plus the amount of a capital reserve fund. And that equation is summarized on this chart, which I'll walk through uh, for you now. Capital improvement costs are essentially the costs that Trump incurred to build a clubhouse at the course. Growing costs are the funds that Trump spent to complete growing the grass at the course. Amortization, which is uh, a factor that reduces these costs, is meant to capture how the costs of this project are recaptured <clears throat> over the term of the contract. In this contract, amortization is calculated on what we call a straight line basis over the 20-year term of the agreement. That means that if you wanted to estimate the amortization amounts, you would take the total of these two costs, capital improvement and growing, divide them by 20, and then multiply it by the number of years that this course has been in operation. The capital reserve fund, which is the last item, kicked in in year five of the contract. 
it amounts to 3% of the gross revenue uh, each year beginning on year five. Now, according to the contract, this fund was reserved to pay for repairs and equipment replacement at the course. Now, we don't have the raw data that would allow us to compute with accuracy uh, what that termination would, fee would be. You would need accountants to determine, based on the data, the exact amount of the fee. But the contract has cost projections, and there have been publicly disclosed revenue figures for the golf course. And it should be remembered that developers try to stay within their budgeted costs to keep their costs as low as possible and as close to the projections as possible. So these budgeted items should be somewhat reliable. Now, based on this information, I believe that the fee that would be owed could be as low as $5 million, and it's highly likely that that fee will be less than $10 million. So let's look at the numbers that are available to us today. Attached to the contract as Exhibit K was a budget. The budget pegged the capital improvement costs at between $9 and $12 million, and they pegged the growing costs at $750,000 to $2.9 million. A news article reported that the growing costs were actually $850,000, which is quite close to the lower range of this estimate. So if you assume that you have um, costs in this range, the cost would be a total of somewhere near 9.75 and $14.9 million. From that, you would then reduce those costs by the amortization amount for the year since the course was completed. Using the budget figures, and assuming those figures were evenly spaced out, those amortization amounts would likely be in the range of $487,000 to $745,000 per year. So if you assume that for, say, a nine-year period, that would put the termination fee in the range of $5.5 to $8 million. You would also need to add back in the capital reserve amount, which is 3% of gross revenues since year five, Publicly available figures about the revenues from this course show that that number is likely to be less than $500,000, so not likely to throw the estimate off very, very much. Of course, these are just estimates. The actual numbers could be higher or they could be lower, and as I mentioned, accountants would need to look at the actual amounts that Trump spent to develop this project. But you should bear in mind that when Trump came on the scene, the course was nearing completion. The city had already invested somewhere around $120 million in this project, so that his investment is relatively modest compared to the total cost that the city spent to build the golf course. Now, before I conclude, it is worth noting that if the, the city were to invoke the termination and pay a termination fee, they could try to recover this fee from a new operator who could be engaged to run the golf course. Or the city could explore other options for this 222-acre property. There are thus benefits to the city if it chooses to exercise its termination rights and get this property back from someone whose reputation is at best highly questionable. With that, I am happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Younger, for your testimony. Um, and I'd like to go over a few of the points that you mentioned, um, since there was a lot of substantive detail in there. Um, just beginning with the grounds for termination. Um, so in plain language, as you've done before, but just to restate, can you explain Section 3.2, the termination, uh, uh, termination at will provision of the contract? Yeah. Termination at will typically means you need no reason whatsoever. Here, though, as I said, it's modified by the words arbitrary and capricious. Our courts use those terms to review agency actions every day of the week under Article 78. Um, presumptively, an agency action is for good reason and not arbitrary, and as I said, there are many good reasons why this, this termination would be appropriate here. So in other words, termination at will, in the sole discretion of the Parks Commissioner, uh, gives the Parks Commissioner the ability to terminate the contract for any reason, caveated here by not, so long as it's not arbitrary or capricious. That's correct. And would you consider the guilty plea on 50 felonies, uh, 15 felonies, sorry, by Weisselberg, would you consider those non-arbitrary and capricious and non-capricious reasons to terminate the license? Absolutely, and particularly since Mr. Weisselberg was CFO of the entity that runs this golf course. And, you know, obviously the CFO is someone who you're counting on to certify numbers every day um, about the course. And would you consider the ongoing civil and criminal investigations into the financial records of the Trump Organization and Donald Trump 
as guarantor of the license. Would you consider those non-arbitrary and non-capricious reasons to terminate the license? Yes, for two reasons. One, um, the city could decide that it's not in their interest to be associated with Mr. Trump. And two, there are sound questions about whether all these investigations may lead to some withering of his assets, his ability to run the courts. I mean, that was part of the basis that Mayor de Blasio terminated under, but it wasn't enough to make a cause termination, which would avoid the termination fee. It certainly would be enough for an at-will termination. So just backing up for a second, bottom line, can the Commission of the Parks Department terminate this agreement today? Absolutely. And that would require 25 days written notice, right? That's correct. So if the Parks Commissioner were to make that termination today, would that termination take effect before the announced date of the Saudi golf, Saudi back golf tournament? As I understand that date, that is correct, because it would be 25 days from today, which would be October 10th. Thank you. Now, Mr. Younger, do you know of any other instances where Parks has terminated a license at will? Well, first, in, in commercial context, people terminate contracts at will all the time. In fact, the average employee is employed at will. Um, and I understand that in the Yankee Stadium situation, um, the Parks Department terminated uh, some concessions at will um, so that they could clear up um, the old Yankee Stadium for use as, as parkland. That's correct. As I understand it, too, there was a, uh, um, a concession, a tennis concession uh, at the neighboring uh, Malali Park in 2009 um, that was terminated at will uh, to build a new Yankee Stadium. So if it can be done for a ba baseball stadium for the Yankees, it can be done to sever the city's ties to the Trump Organization. Uh, now, one more question for you on the termination part, too. We've been talking about termination at will. But is it your understanding in the contract there are multiple different methods for terminating this license? Yeah, so, so there are two basic kinds of termination. One is for cause, which would be a default, and that was the, the round that uh, the prior administration took. The court said there wasn't cause, the other is at will, which is what I've been describing today. And, and the judge who had that case clearly distinguished between these two types of termination. So multiple grounds for termination. Um, are you aware of uh, uh, this administration pursuing either of those grounds of termination to date? Not to my knowledge. You're an attorney, former president of the State Bar Association. Uh, I'm an attorney as well. Uh, when you make legal arguments, when you take a case to court, at the very least, is it your understanding that the best way to lawyer it is to really make as many different arguments as you can, to pursue every claim as possible in the alternative, to use every basis you've got uh, to make your argument? That's what we were all taught in law school to do. That's right. You learned that on the first day of law school. And so if you learn that on the first day of law school, if you're seeking to terminate a license, for example, if you were to bring a case to court or in any way, would you seek to use multiple bases and multiple opportunities and pathways to terminate that license pursuant to the contract? Absolutely. Remember, in this situation, the Parks Commissioner doesn't have to go to court. I assume, you know, the Trump entity may be, you know, challenging in court, but, you know, all they have to do is issue a, a notice. That's Great it. notice, and that's it. Thank you. Now, let's move to the, the topic of the so-called uh, termination payment. And just as a starting matter, this would only apply the alleged termination payment if the Parks Commissioner went the path of immediate termination. Of at-will termination. Of at-will termination, yeah, That's Sorry. correct. Yes. Correct. So there are it, other ways... If it was for a default, it would not, uh, there would be no termination fee. Right. So one pathway would uh, give rise to a potential termination payment, another pathway there would be no termination payment. Correct. Now, the mayor has repeated the Trump Organization's claim that termination, let me repeat that again, has repeated the Trump Organization's claim that the termination of this license at will would cost $30 million. You're familiar with that claim. I saw that in the press. Where was the first time you saw that claim reported? Um, it was first came uh, from a quote from Eric Trump. So Eric Trump makes the claim of $30 million, and now City Hall is, is promoting that claim. But let me ask you this. Have you seen such a number? Have you seen $30 million anywhere in this license agreement? I cannot fathom how you can calculate a $30 million termination fee. As I've indicated, I've looked at the estimates that were attached to the agreement. I've looked at the reported revenues 
that you know have been reported publicly, and I can't come up with a number even close to thirty million dollars. And have you even seen the, the, the number thirty million itself mentioned in the termination payment paragraphs of the license? It's nowhere. It, it, all that's in the contract is a formula. Is a formula. Yeah. No mention of numbers. And as I mentioned, I took the estimates that were also in the contract, applied them, and then also publicly reported data, and it comes nowhere near to thirty million dollars. So I think in your uh, test. By the way, just so you yeah. understand, this is a return of an investment. It would be as if you were buying out someone who is your partner. Um, what the city gets is they get full and unfettered rights to this golf course back, which is a valuable right. And so, you know, whatever that number is, you know, would be a fair representation of what someone else might pay <laughs> to operate this course if mm -hmm. uh, they were to take over. So any termination payment, regardless of what the amount is, could be recoverable, recoverable by the city uh, in other ways as yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, uh, someone who's in the business of running golf courses would have to tell you what the numbers are, but you sure. know, if you think about a course of this quality, um, you know, there's obviously, you know, and, and there was another manager re willing to step up, you know, when the prior administration terminated. Mm -hmm. And so, I think it was your testimony that, that the supposed or alleged potential payment, if you went by termination at will by that method, uh, would not be anywhere close to $30 million. Correct, that's, right? that's my belief. Mm -hmm. In fact, what was the range that you had given? My estimate is between 5 and $10 million. Five and, ten million. and that's just at the outset, right? That's before you even claim receipts, reimbursement, have a team of auditors, lawyers, look through and line item every single expense. We're talking about the outside claim um, before you, right out of the gate, before you even start that process of disputing it. Look, this is what we litigators do every day of the week. We get expert accountants in, they sharpen their pencils, they find you know, things that really shouldn't be in those numbers. Obviously, you know, some of these numbers, for example, the, the reserve fund, they may have spent already, so that would not be in there any longer you know, if they spent it on replacement you know, uh, lawnmowers, et cetera. So you know, you'd really have to sharpen your pencil and, you know, and, and get to a, a truly accurate number. And isn't it also true in the, and I think you mentioned your testimony, but in the license agreement itself, there is mention of an amortization, a 20-year amortization yeah. timeline. A 20-year straight line. So, you know, there are two different ways to amortize. One is accelerated appreciation. It's like a depreciation schedule. The other is straight line. So it's literally every year for the 20 years of this contract, the costs that have been spent a recoup because you're getting making money off of it you know so you know a business if you build a warehouse and it's expected to last for 20 years you get revenues each year and so then you know the cost that you have spent has been amortized each year and so those depreciation costs are, are baked into the determination payment calculation that's in the license that's correct and uh, what year was this license signed and the license was signed February 21st 2012 okay. what year are we in now 2022 Thank you. Uh, so in other words, it seems that the commissioner could terminate this license right now for roughly the same cost as building a bathroom in a New York City park. <laughs> Let's go to the next topic, the special permits. Do you think a tournament like this would require approval from the Parks Department? Yes. If you look at Section 9.3A of the contract, if you were to close the, the course for a day for a tournament, you need prior written approval from uh, the Parks Department. So there has to be some document where the Parks Department approved uh, this tournament because uh, the, the golf course will be closed. Mm -hmm. And sorry, what section of that uh, was the contract? Section 9.3A, sub little i. So in your examination of this license, its terms and conditions, do you I'm sorry, also, if you close it to the public on Saturdays and Sundays, it also needs prior written approval of the parks. And I believe this tournament is also occurring partly on a weekend, too. Yeah. So in your examination of the license, its terms and conditions, like Section 9.3A in terms of a special approval, do you think that a term tournament of this nature and scope could happen without the cooperation and support of City Hall? One, you know, it needs Parks Department approval. Two, 
something of this nature is a very big endeavor. So, you know, you know, I would understand that there would be a fair amount of, you know, dialogue going in between the, you know, just look at what happened when we had the U.S. Open here uh, a couple weeks ago. You know, it's, it's, it's not a small endeavor. Thank you. I'd like to move now to a point you mentioned about uh, the accounting firm, Mazars Accounting. Um, the Parks Department's recommendation to award this license to the Trump Organization has a section titled Financial Resources Slash Adequate Accounting and Auditing Procedures. Can you tell me who attested to the financial strength of the Trump Organization? Yeah, it's, um, it is actually the, the financial, if you want to put it up, it's the financial strength of Mr. Trump himself. Um, and it's his accounting firm, Weiser's. Um, it's a letter right there. Um, and it says that he's, so, so what the Parks Department wants to know, Trump Ferry Point LLC, all they own is this contract, right? And so who's standing behind it? Mr. Trump personally. So they want to know that if there's any default, that Mr. Trump will be worth it. And as you can see from the Weiser certification, that he's, they said he was worth well more than $3 billion. That's these same certifications our attorney general is, you know, in, in the process of investigating. But in the middle of that investigation, the accounting firm pulled all of um, his certifications like this since 2012. So in other words, Mazar certified to the strength, the financial strength of Donald Trump as the guarantor of this agreement, which means functionally he's guaranteeing financially uh, this LLC, right? What does it mean in plain language to be the guarantor? Yeah, it means that if there's any default by the LLC, he will stand behind it. He'll, he'll pay every nickel that the LLC was supposed to pay. Mm -hmm. And Wiser Mazars, the accounting firm, now known as Mazars USA, as you mentioned, do they still stand by their statements regarding the financial strength of the Trump Organization or Donald Trump? No, it's been publicly reported that they uh, withdrew all their certifications since 2012. For what time range of Trump's financial records have they retracted their support? I, th I believe it's from 2012 uh, through, uh, I'm sorry, 2011, I apologize, to 2000, 2020. And why did Mazars retract their support? I believe it's because of the circumstances surrounding the multiple investigations into whether the assets that were listed on those financial statements as being Trump's net worth were actually accurate. And that's something that the Attorney General is actively investigating. Okay. <clears throat> so Mazars, Trump's auditor, has since disavowed any representation it made on behalf of the licensee or this guarantor. Would you say that this material misrepresentation of financial strength of the licensee or its guarantor, would you say that provides a non-arbitrary and non-capricious reason to terminate this license? Clearly. I mean, <laughs> there's no more fundamental reason that you enter into a contract that the person you're entering into the contract with can pay for a default. Um, you're not going to enter into a contract if that party can't own up to their own word. And in fact, the Parks Department relied on those certifications when it issued the license in the first place. Absolutely. No further questions for me, if anyone else on the committee has any questions. Oh, uh, Council Member Carr. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Today, it seems to me that we're gathered here for one reason and one reason only, and rather than it be for some high public purpose, it is because of the obsessive hatred some have for Donald Trump. There's no other explanation I can think of for an oversight hearing that chooses to focus on only one of our 12 public golf courses under the jurisdiction of the Parks Department. Are those other public courses so free of issues that they're not worthy of the attention of this committee? I doubt it, and in some cases, I know it. I have three such public courses in my home borough. Two of them, La Tourette and South Shore, are managed by American Golf under a parks concession agreement, which has been a terrible steward of these public gems. Now, I freely admit that these are not courses that are likely to be stops for a PGA tour or for the country club set, but they are visited by many middle class Staten Islanders and other New Yorkers. They are as a public golf course ideally should be, the regular Joe or Jane's golf courses. And from them, I only hear complaints fairways that are overgrown, broken car paths, dilapidated carts, tee boxes that are nothing but mud, and a parking lot which is in such a state that patrons can hardly navigate it and not park without risk to their personal vehicles. And for the record, American Golf operates two other such concessions 
Diker Beach in Brooklyn, and Clearview in Queens. In contrast, Staten Island's third public course, Silver Lake, is phenomenally well kept. Would it not be a better use of our time and energy to learn about the challenges of public golf courses under bad management and what we could learn from those that are well cared for? Sadly, that does not appear to be why we're here today. Today's investigatory approach is motivated by one thought, orange man bad. That's it, plain and simple. Why else ignore the rest of the public course network and focus on a site that was successfully transformed from a brownfield in desperate need of investment to a world-class golf course that attracts local and international bookings? Why else focus on a contract at Ferry Point that the city has previously tried and failed to cancel and would likely fail again if they attempted to do so? Perhaps we should consider awarding all of the concessions of the poorly operated public courses to the Trump Organization so that they can get this level of attention. The council has a duty to ensure that the city's public assets are well used and maintained. And any oversight hearing of our public courses must assuredly have included Ferry Point. But by ignoring the other 11, this committee abdicates its oversight obligations in favor of a vendetta, and that should not be. Thank you so much, Council Member Carr. Um, any other? Oh, and at this point also, I'll just uh, read out the names of the council members who have been in attendance at today's hearing. Um, council Member Holden, uh, Council Member Moya, Council Member Dinowitz, Council Member Lee, Council Member Marte, Council Member Menon, Council Member Narcisse, Council Member Ressler, Council Member Ung, Council Member Velasquez, and Council Member Carr. Thank you so much, Mr. Younger, for your testimony today. Um, I really appreciate it, and so does this committee and the council. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Next, we'll call as our, as our next witness uh, virtually uh, is Brett uh, Eagleson. Thank you for having me. You may begin. Thank you, Mr. Eagleson. Yes, uh, thank you. My name is Brett Eagleson. I am the president of a group called 9-11 Justice. I lost my father on 9-11 when I was 15 years old. Um, I have spent the majority of my adult life advocating on behalf of the victims of 9-11. Uh, our main focus, our main issue has been over the past eight years is um, pressuring our federal government to declassify documents which we know show the complicity of the kingdom of Saudi Arabia behind the 9-11 attacks. And um, I just wanted to say just a few short days ago, uh, we came together as a country and um, people from communities all across this country gathered together to remember the events of 9-11. We read names, we talked about stories, we heard about all the lives that were lost that day. 21 years ago, we vowed as a nation to never forget. That was our mantra, never forget, never forget. And um, as the speaker had pointed out earlier in her opening comments, she alluded to a number of facts that were outlined in the 9-11 Commission report. One thing I wanted to add and clarify to the speaker's comments is the 9-11 Commission report ended in 2004. The 9-11 Commission report uh, drew a number of criticisms and made a number of assertions about the role that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia played. But the 9-11 Commission report never fully got to the bottom of the Saudi role in 9-11. And I'm here today to talk about that we now have gotten to the bottom of that role thanks to a presidential executive order last year from President Biden in 2021. Since the 9-11 Commission report ended in 2004, uh, we have heard from multiple members of that commission that that commission itself was underfunded, it was rushed, and it did not have the time to pursue all of the leads. In 2006, we have learned that there was a secret FBI investigation opened up called Operation Encore. Operation Encore began, this is important to note, the Operation Encore investigation was specifically devoted to, dis to investigate all of the leads into the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's role in 9-11. That, that investigation did not begin until 2006. So it's two years after the conclusion of the 9-11 Commission report. From 2006 into 2021, Operation Encore investigated the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's role. You've heard that right. Not China's role, not Russia's role, not Canada's role. 
Operation Encore investigated the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's role in 9-11. For years, we were pressuring our federal government legislatively and, uh, and the executive branch to declassify those documents. Well, in September of 2021, uh, we successfully pressured President Biden, kudos to him, for um, honoring a campaign promise that he made to our groups of families. He issued a presidential executive order which called upon the FBI to declassify all of its documents to the greatest extent possible about the investigations into Saudi Arabia. Over the past year, we've been receiving numerous documents from the Department of Justice. And I just wanted to state for the committee and for the people of New York today, we can, we can strongly and confidently say that our Federal Bureau of Investigation has identified 12 Saudi government officials who are directly responsible for assisting the 9-11 hijackers. One of those Saudi government officials was working for the Saudi intelligence agency. That is akin to one of our CIA operatives operating in some foreign country and killing members of that country. That is who the city and that is who the Trump organization is doing business with. I also wanted to highlight an experience personally that I had with President Trump in 2019. You see, our group has been on this issue for a number of years. And in 2019, President Trump invited me to the White House to meet with him. He invited me, along with members of our community and along with a number of former F FBI agents. We, ple we pleaded and begged with the president to declassify the, the uh, FBI documents. The president looked me in the eye, he shook my hand, he looked my mother in the eye, he shook her hand, and he met uh, at least 12 uh, 9-11 family members that day. And he said he would do everything he could and that he was absolutely going to declassify all the FBI documents that we have been shouting about for years. Less than 24 hours later, the president's attorney general, Bill Barr, invoked what's known as the state secrets principle, essentially bringing a nuclear weapon to a fist fight. The state secrets principle has never been utilized in the history of this country in a civil lawsuit. So we had uh, a president who uh, shook our hands, looked us in the eye on 9-11, told us that he was gonna help us 24 hours later, pulls a 180, completely reneges on that process and has his attorney general, Bill Barr, invoke state secrets, ensuring that all of the information uh, uh, related to the Saudi Arabian role in 9-11 would continue to remain under lock and key. It wasn't until President Biden's executive order in 2021, which unwound that state secrets principle designation, that we are now seeing the true role of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I think as a 9-11 family member and as an advocate on so many of, of those that lost loved ones that day, for the city of New York to ignore this point, for the country, for the nation to ignore this point, I think it is a travesty. I think it is uh, adds insult to injury. It, it, it um, it's like pouring salt on an open wound. Um, I also wanted to point out the fact that in 2016, President, then candidate Trump himself, uh, twice live on air on a Fox and Friends interview and on Sean Hannity later that night, proclaimed that it was the kingdom of Saudi Arabia who knocked down those towers. He said, it wasn't, it wasn't the Iraqis, it was the Saudis. Why don't we open up the documents? Why don't we have somebody like Bush or something open up those documents and you'll find out that it was the Saudis that knocked down those towers. Now that was in 2016. In 2019, the president met with myself and a number of our family members and said he was gonna help us. 24 hours after that meeting, he invoked what's known as the state secrets principle. And then in 2021, the president is hosting the Saudis at a number of his courses all across this country. And I know there's another, uh, sorry I couldn't be there in person today, but uh, I think we're well represented there today with a number of family members who I believe are gonna speak after me who have examples of the documents and they can walk you through line by line of what the FBI says that the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia did. So I don't wanna take up too much uh, of any, anyone else's time, but I did just wanna take the opportunity to State, state, the, state those points. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Eagleston, uh, and we hope that the Parks Commissioner and um, administration will do the right thing here and terminate this license and cancel the tournament. Uh, our next witness um, is also virtual, Sharice Palomino. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Sharice Palomino and I'm the Director of Advocacy and Programs and New Yorkers for Parks. 
New Yorkers for Parks is the only independent nonprofit parks advocacy and research organization focusing on New York City. We are a founding member of the Playfair Coalition, which includes over 400 organizations across the five boroughs. I'm testifying today about how our organization has supported the city in the aftermath of 9-11. New Yorkers for Parks Daffodil Project is the largest annual volunteer effort in New York City history, conceived as a living memorial to the victims of 9-11. Since the Daffodil Project's inception in 2001, over 9 million daffodil bulbs have been distributed for free, planted by tens of thousands of volunteers in the fall, and celebrated each spring as the millions of daffodils bloom across the city in the spring. This project is a meaningful and resonant living remembrance for the many who lived in New York City in 2001, the families who lost their lives, lost, lost their lives, and to the many first responders. The project also became a symbol of hope for a better city and a greater recognition of what parks means to New Yorkers. It is important for our city to deeply consider the relationships it makes and the messages those relationships sends to its residents. We stand with empathy and understanding for all the family members who are testifying today and their deep concern for the proposed event at the Trump links in the Bronx. New Yorkers for Parks champions park equity and access to the city's parkland in hopes that vendors that the city contracts implements equitable business practices that supports New York City's diverse population. This expectation aligns with New Yorkers for Parks call for transformative investment in our park system. 1% of the city budget for parks can ensure that all New Yorkers have fair and equitable access to the city's parklands. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharice. Uh, next up, we would call as a witness, Brian Crowell. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I've, I've got to say that I had a bunch of notes prepared and I've kind of thrown most of them out and, and uh, I've written some different things down because I honestly thought this was going to be a hearing um, and it does feel like it was a relatively rehearsed indictment here. I, I understand there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of politics, there's a, a lot of different angles here, but from my understanding, a hearing is supposed to hear all sides of the issue, and I think we need to better define the issue here. Um, I, I personally want to uh, give my sympathy and my thoughts to everyone involved with the 9-11 thing. This, uh, that, that tragedy is something we will never forget, and to hear people talking um, about that is very moving, and, and trust me, I want justice as much as anyone. I, I hope that we can find all the people responsible for that and bring them to serious justice. Um, but, but to be honest, uh, we're, we're trying to separate a, a golf facility from that tragedy right now. I, you have all of my thoughts and prayers because I, I am as angry about that event as, as anyone else in this room. But what I want to say right now is that I'm here to represent a, a group of nearly 170 employees at a very successful business, and we provide a, a very nice service, a high-end service for the members of New York City, the residents of New York City, and the surrounding area. Um, some of the data that was quoted by you earlier uh, was, was quite a bit skewed. Um, you were quoting prices that were not accurate, so I've changed some of those thoughts in my presentation here, but uh, the bottom line is we offer junior rates for $60. We offer rates for military and senior residents of the city for $100. So I don't want people to think that this is exorbitant. It is not exorbitant. If it was exorbitant, we probably would have a hard time serving people not just once, but dozens of times in the same season. We're doing nearly 30,000 rounds and providing a great opportunity for members of this city and the surrounding area. Um, I also want to mention that we are doing our best to support charities. 
I myself uh, have, have okayed nearly $50,000 worth of donations to local causes and charities through giving away foursomes to our, our facility. We, we have hosted Tunnel to Towers events, the Captain's Endowment Fund, the, the Uniformed Fire Officers Association. We, you're talking about a very patriotic group here. I understand the politics and I understand how this whole day started with about 60 minutes of straight negatives about Mr. Trump. But I, I've, I've got to tell you, we have not seen him on the property. We are producing something that we're very proud of. I'm here to talk about the charitable components that we do. We hosted the public school athletic league championships. We host Regis High School. We've got Fordham and NYU practicing there. We've got, we've got 170 employees and their families that are very proud of the work we do at Trump Golf Links at Ferry Point. We are not political. I know it's hard because everyone sees the name in big uh, concrete stones as they drive over the bridge, but we are not political. We are a golf operation and a very nice dining operation, and we, we provide a great experience for the members of this city and the surrounding communities. We're charitable, we're doing our best, and, and I feel very proud of the people that work for us on this property. I'm the general manager, I'm fortunate to be the general manager, and I'm proud of the work that all these people behind me are doing and all the rest of the staff and their families. I, I just, again, with all due respect to 9-11 and the families and everyone that was affected by that tragedy, I'm, I'm here to defend a golf operation. And really, that's what we're talking about. And we have honored our contract to this point we keep a beautiful facility there. I think uh, the gentleman over here mentioned how the other golf facilities in the New York City roster look, and uh, this is not about that. Beth Page is in the middle of Long Island. This is a, just an incredible opportunity and amenity for people in this city, and, and we have shown that to be the case. I understand the politics. I am keeping politics out of my testimony. I am telling you this is a successful operation that does a lot of good for a lot of people, and I am not here to defend Saudi Arabia. <laughs> that is for darn sure. I'm not here to defend anything politically other than the fact that we are honoring our contract, producing a very high-end experience for people that come back over and over and over again, and this, this is not politics for us. It's our livelihood. It's the families. The people behind me represent the community, largely the Bronx, but all five boroughs. So I, I just want to make sure that, that we show the, the obvious respect to the 9-11 to the groups and the families and everyone that lost lives and friends and loved ones because uh, we feel that pain. I lost friends in 9-11, and, and it's a very, very touching problem that we continue to fight. But this is about a golf operation. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Crow, for your testimony. Um, I just have a uh, uh, few questions for you. So you're the, the general manager for Trump Golf Links at Fairpoint Park, yes. right? Okay. Um, and were you involved in the uh, organizing of this, or will you be involved in the operation of this tournament coming up next month? By virtue of the fact that we are the host site, um, yes. Mm -hmm. And so who from this uh, mail administration uh, approved a permit for the Aramco Team Series uh, event uh, that's happening next month? To, to be honest, I don't know the specific names. That was not a process I was involved in. Mm -hmm. I know that it was brought before the council and, and uh, the mayor himself and his crew apparently uh, uh, said okay and green-lighted the whole process. So that's, that's kind of the, the interesting part of all this is I think it was approved by parks and the mayor's administration and everyone else. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm simply here representing the group that, yeah. that operates the property. Do you know when um, the, the mayor administration um, and the parks uh, department approved this tournament? I, I, I would be guessing. I believe it was earlier this very year. It was, if I'm not mistaken, sometime in early 22. I mm -hmm. um, just want to point up uh, an exhibit uh, that we have here. Um, which shows a quote that uh, uh, Eric Trump uh, had given to the, in the New York Times which on September 8th, so last week, saying a big thank you to the city of New York and to the Parks Department for their support and approval. 
Um, and then subsequently, the next day, a tweet that, as the Times noted, has now been deleted, that says, I'm so confused, the city approved this tournament in writing in May, and has been working on logistics, parking, et cetera, nonstop. Um, so it, it, it does, um, to your point, um, it, it tracks, as you were saying, that this, this was approved by um, the, the mayor's office um, and also the parks department. Um, and so I guess I'm just wondering, so does that sound right to you that the, the tournament was approved in May? Uh, is that what it says? It was approved in May? Yeah, it says the city approved this tournament, or he says uh, the city approved this tournament in May and has been working on logistics uh, nonstop. Yeah, that, that must be right. Yeah, I think it was, like I said, early 22. May is maybe when the whole process concluded with an approval from those offices. But um, we first heard of the possibility of it probably in March or April, somewhere around there. So again, as far as when it was actually approved by the mayor and his, his folks, uh, it must be May. Right, and so you're right. You first heard about this, meaning you heard about it from within the Trump organization or associates, or how did you first hear in your role as the general manager about the, uh, uh, the tournament potentially happening? Yeah, I, I heard, like I said, maybe in March or April that there was, um, there was a discussion that this was a possibility. But mm -hmm. that's, again, all I really knew at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And who did you hear that from? Mm, I, I honestly can't recall. Okay. And do you know who at the Parks Department approved the, the permit for the tournament? I do not. And who, I'm assuming in your role as the um, general manager, uh, have you been working with the Parks Department on the logistics that Eric Trump mentions for the planning of the tournament? Is that something that falls in the purview of your responsibilities? Uh, not directly, no. Okay. So who would be involved then for the golf course in working with the Parks Department um, in the logistics and planning for this tournament? I, I, there are, there's a tournament uh, group that is um, in charge of conducting all the uh, operations for the event. So uh, that group, I'm sure, has spoken with Parks on a number of occasions, and uh, those, those discussions are ongoing. The tournament group is part of the Ferry Point? Part of what, what's the tournament group? Uh, there, there's, a, there's a group that is hired to oversee the tournament operations for the Aramco Team Series. So there is a, uh, a field staff that I'm sure have been in touch with the Parks Department, and they're, they're kind of in talks together. And who, who hires them? You said they're hired by, uh, this, this tournament group is hired to work with the Parks yeah, Department. I'm, Do you know, you who know what, that, that goes long before my time. Again, I first heard of the whole thing in, in March or April. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to correct something to that. This, this matter was not brought uh, before the council, um, as far as, as I know. Um, but another question uh, that I had was, uh, so do you know the tournament group, do you know which division they've been working with in the Parks Department? Do you know what the conversations have been as far, because in your role as general manager, it seems that some of this information would filter uh, back to you so you can help run the operation of the course. Do you know who uh, they've been talking with in the Parks Department or what the subject of those conversations have been? Not specific names. Like I said, that they have been communicating with us on site to talk about how the tournament is gonna unfold and how the weeks leading up to the tournament will take shape. So we've been helping from a day-to-day -day operations standpoint, but the decision-making is at a different level, and I have not been involved in that. And so who is involved, besides the tournament group, who from the Trump uh, golf links is involved? Because I'm assuming someone is uh, as part of those conversations with the Parks Department um, and the mayor's office and all of these logistics and the approval. Yeah, that's primarily uh, the Trump golf executive leadership. So um, you, could, you could check with Trump golf uh, leaders on all of that. Um, and when you say Trump golf leaders, are those representatives from the Trump organization or who, who are the Trump golf leaders? Well, uh, one of them is on the, on the uh, demonstration behind you there, but uh, you know, from, from Eric, there are uh, executives in, in the Trump golf organization that would have uh, leadership roles in all of this, and I'm, I'm not comfortable going through all of those names at this point in time, but it's public knowledge. Mm -hmm. And have you seen any of the written paperwork or approvals um, about uh, this tournament uh, from the Parks Department in your capacity as uh, general manager? I, I did hear that it was approved by um, the Parks and, and the Mayor's administration, so that's really the extent of my 
knowledge or, or visual of any contracts or paperwork. Got it. Okay. But you haven't seen any written documents. Um, I mean, because the written approval was required. So I'm just curious if, if you were a recipient of those documents. I, we, we are in possession of, of a, a, an approved contract. So I did see it come across. I could not quote you on all of that. Sure. A lot of, lot of verbiage there. So. Mm -hmm. But there is an approved contract that you, that yes. you are in possession yeah. of. Got it. Okay. Um, and that was signed between the Parks Department and uh, Trump Golf Links, or the Parks Department and the Trump Organization, do you remember by any chance? Yeah, I can't really remember that. I, but again, that's, that's something that I'm sure the Parks Department could produce. Mm -hmm. um, and is there, so in your role as general manager leading up to the tournament, um, are you going to be involved in any of the planning and logistics with the Parks Department? Presumably as it gets closer to you know, the, the, the tournament itself, are there operations that you'll be conducting yourself personally with the Parks Department or planning operations that you'll be well, conducting with them? Yeah, we, we've got weekly meetings and, and discussions. Uh, obviously, there are some logistics that we're all, you know, keeping close tabs on parking and traffic patterns and how this is all going to work with, uh, with public access. So there, there's, there's a lot of things that we have discussed. Yes, we're, we're uh, basically collaborating with them to make this a successful event. Mm -hmm. And you're part of those weekly meetings, right? Yeah, not not necessarily with parks, but I have been, you know, again, it's kind of handed down and the uh, on-site representation of the Aramco series shares a lot of meeting time with us and we go through things. So it, it's pretty much open lines of communication, but I have not been in a room with uh, specific members of the parks. Okay, so you meet with the Aramco uh, tournament representatives and they're the ones that meet with the Parks Department? Is that how it works? Yeah, that's more or less how, it, how it's been happening. Got it. Um, given the, the, the poignant words that you made before about 9-11 um, and the families who are here today too, um, are you supportive of the decision to have the, uh, this tournament next month given the fact that it's one month after the, uh, uh, the at 21st anniversary of 9-11? So just this is a personal opinion question. It's a question. Um, I, I have I have concerns like all of us. I think I think um, there's a lot of different perspectives in this. I am very sympathetic uh, to the folks behind me um, in terms of the 9/11 families. I support that fund. My wife and my daughter run for Tunnel to Towers in, in the New York City Marathon. I mean, we're we're very patriotic people, and and it it becomes a much bigger question than that. And, and frankly, I think there are so many layers to this that that it gets a little confusing. Um, what, I've, what I've done is, is really said to myself, you know, we're gonna run a great event that is gonna be beneficial for the people in New York and the surrounding communities. Uh, again, this is, this is a, uh, a duty of the, the, the staff I represent behind me, and we're gonna do our best to run a great event. Um, I, I, I really don't feel like taking a political statement other than I understand. Uh, I understand both sides. And uh, it kind of forces me to go back in time to the point when it was approved by, by Parks and the council and the mayor's administration. Um, th to be honest, once I heard they had all approved this, it made me feel a little better about it. And just correcting for the record that it was not approved by the council. Um, but uh, thanks for your testimony. One last question I had for you too um, is, is it your testimony today, I just want to make sure I have this correct, but is it your testimony that um, even as the general manager of uh, Trump Golf Links at Ferry Point, uh, that you were not involved in the planning of this tournament and that it was the Trump executives and Aramco who are working directly with the parks and the administration? Is that well, your testimony? No, I, I should clarify that. I'm, I'm, I am responsible for helping to make this a very successful event. So, so it depends on how you read the copy there, but the, the bottom line is uh, we want this to be a success since we are hosting it. So I'm, I'm directly involved with the operations of the event. Uh, what I'm saying is that I personally was not involved in the decision to, to host it. Mm -hmm. And is it was, also, oh sorry, go ahead. That was above me. Mm -hmm. And is it also your testament that the Trump executives and Aramco are the ones that are working directly with City Hall and the Parks Department or had conversations with them in the lead up to this tournament? Yes, yeah, they're, they're the ones who really, uh, you know, s went through all the details to make sure it was appropriate at the time. Okay.
Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Next, we'll call uh, from uh, the Trump Organization, John Gruber. Good morning. My name is John Gruber, and I was the construction manager responsible for the building of the Ferry Point Clubhouse. Uh, the Trump Org built a world-class uh, clubhouse that complements the Jack Nicholas design golf course. Uh, the Trump Org spent considerably more money than was required by the parks contract to build the clubhouse. The clubhouse and the golf course are run at the same level of quality as the other private Trump Org properties in both New York and New Jersey. Trump Org not only runs the golf course, but they also run an exceptional restaurant and catering facility. The food service that the Trump Org provides not only caters to the golfers, but also serves the local community. If the Trump Org were to lose the contract, it would greatly impact the employees, many of whom reside in the Bronx. Many of the employees have worked at the golf course since its inception. If the contractor is revoked, all of the staff and their families would be gravely affected. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a couple questions for you, Mr. Mr. Gruber. Uh, you had stated that you were involved in the construction of, of this property, right? Correct. Um, how much were your capital improvement costs? Excuse me? How much were your capital improvement costs? Well, Parks has all the records with all the totals. I, you know, it's been, you know, a number of years, so I could not give you any kind of accurate numbers. Mm -hmm. okay. So Parks has, you know, from the growing, from the construction, they have every document, everything comes to them in triplicate. So Parks has all of these documents? Yes. And I would suspect the same thing then for your growing costs too. Those are records Correct. department. Everything department. related to the construction growing, the uh, clubhouse, temporary clubhouse, everything they have. Mm -hmm. And I would assume that you consider yourself a responsible construction manager developer, right? And so as a construction manager, is it customary to project a budget and go over that budget by a factor of three times, four times what the, what the proposed budget was? Well, it depends, you know, with this, uh, you know, with this project, um, we had, you know, we we're on a landfill, you know, it's not a standard, you know, just excavate a four foot footing and pour some concrete. We had, you know, structural steel that had to be set, you know, to bedrock, it was all the pilings, you know, it was, it was quite complicated. Uh, we had a contract with, with the city to build, a, you know, the property at a certain rate. We went over that because again, we had to build a uh, quality building that would match the quality of the golf course. So we did, you know, we spent more than was required. Mm -hmm. But presumably, just generally speaking, developers, construction managers, can't make a living going so far above your projected costs, right? I mean, if we're talking in general, I would assume that you all try to stick as much as possible to the projected costs or projected budget that's proposed in any kind of construction agreement. Well, you know, we're, you know, we're trying to stay within budget. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what we had to build in the, in the, you know, once we actually got started, we realized it was going to cost more and we, you know, we had to follow suit. We had to build a quality building. Mm -hmm. You know, we built, again, what was approved by, you know, the Parks Department. They, you know, Hart Howard and with his designers, we built exactly what, uh, what was proposed. Mm -hmm. And d is it your testimony that this, the cost of this project went over budget by factor of three times what was proposed? No, didn't go over by three times. Okay. And again, if Parks has the figures, you want to look at the figures, get a hold of Parks and they will give you the figures. Got it, okay, it's all with Parks. Um, in your role as construction manager, uh, did you have any um, involvement with the uh, accounting firm, Mazars, or any financial records, or was that outside of your purview of uh, your responsibility? That's out of my purview. No further questions. Thank okay. you. All right. uh, we're going to call one more. Uh, another witness, next witness, sorry, is uh, Adam Lockwood.
you, you may begin. Uh, good afternoon. I'm the director of golf at Trump Golf Links at Ferry Point. Um, this position that I've held here is, uh, has been such an honor. It provides, uh, Trump Golf Links provides an experience unlike any other in New York City. Um, I think, I know that all of New York City looks to Trump Golf Links for a, a high-end golf experience um, at an affordable rate, especially when you consider the rates of other top courses in the country. Um, we've become a destination for all of New York City, um, all over, people all over the country, and not only that, but we've also reached to uh, people all over the world. Uh, the people who come to Ferry Point, they come there for the Trump experience. The Trump golf experience, um, they, they, it sets a standard for um, the club, the market that they're in. Um, I'm fortunate enough to work at other Trump properties and visit others as well. And I'm confident that they, they set the standard uh, for whatever market they're in when it comes to course conditions, facilities, uh, events that they, that they run. Um, Trump, Trump golf, they do it the right way. Uh, I'm also um, incredibly proud to be a part of the team at Ferry Point. Um, the team there that, that the Trump organization has built uh, is just simply incredible. They come from all political views. Uh, they come to work at Trump Ferry Point for the world-class facility that it is. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, just a couple questions. Um, how much, this is a public golf course, right? It is, yes. And how much would it cost for someone, let's say I wanted to play golf, I'm not a good golfer, but I want to go play golf tomorrow on the course. How much would it cost for uh, on a typical Saturday? A Saturday? Yeah. Uh, I believe it's uh, 208 for a New York City resident. Sorry? 208 for a New York City resident. $208 for a New York City resident. I believe so, yes. Got it. Thank you. Um, and this is a public course again, right? It is. Okay. Um, do you consider that cost accessible to the average New Yorker? I do, absolutely. Yeah, whenever you... Um, whenever you compare it to other top courses across the country, um, there are there are places that are much higher. Um, you know, you you go out west to um, you know a similar similar cost of living area in California. You have Pebble Beach; uh, they pay over six hundred dollars for a round of golf. Mm -hmm. You have other resorts; they charge three, four, five hundred dollars. Um, in in markets that the cost of living is even lower than it is here. And. How many New York City residents do you think, uh, on average, uh, percentage-wise, come to the golf course to play versus residents from other places across the world? Uh, I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't have an accurate, uh, an accurate estimate of that. Okay. No ballpark range either? I do not know. Mm -hmm. But you do, I think it was your testimony, right, that there are many people who come from outside of New York City to there play are, this golf yes, course? There are, yes, yes. So we've ha I've had a lot of people reach out to me who... Um, they, they play Trump Golf Links and they play at Turnberry, they play at Junebeg, uh, which, are, which are in Europe. And they come, when they come to New York, they want to continue getting that Trump Golf experience, so they reach out to us. Got it. And would you have a sense of roughly what percentage of uh, people who come to play at the golf course are Bronx residents? What's that? I'm sorry. Do you have a rough sense of what percentage of uh, those who use the, play golf at the public golf course at Ferry Point Park, what percentage are residents of the Bronx? Uh, I do not have that, no. No further questions. Thank you. All right. Our next witness is going to be uh, De Dennis McGinley. Thanks again for having us testify here again today. And, and we are grateful um, to the mayor for meeting with us uh, a couple weeks ago as well and for keeping an open line of communication going forward. I, I think we feel if, you know, if we could get this tournament canceled, 
It would, could be a spark or a shot across the bow of having any of these other Saudi-backed golf tournaments, uh, you know, within miles of ground zero, canceled going forward. And, and you know, canceled, I, I think, within this country, to be, to be honest with you. But I just wanted to share, <coughs> it's an essay I wrote last week that made it into the USA Today. I think it sums up our feelings pretty well. I saw the first potted mums on a neighbor's doorstep the other day. The first trigger that takes place every year ushers in the week of anxiety and grief my entire family dreads. It's the week around the anniversary of 9-11, the day our oldest brother Danny was murdered on the 89th floor of the South Tower. Danny was 40 years old, the oldest brother of Marty, Tom, me, and Mike, the firstborn son of Dan Sr. and Connie, the husband of Peggy, and father of their five young children. Like my family, I'm sure the thousands of other 9-11 families have their triggers as well. I spoke with Danny shortly before the second plane hit. Like the other 2,977 souls that were murdered that day, he would have given anything to get out of those buildings and home to his family. I know this because it's one of the last things he said to me. I just wish our government would have given something towards helping Danny, the other victims, and their surviving families obtain justice and accountability over the last 20 years. Every president from George W. Bush to Donald Trump has done everything in their power to prevent the 9-11 victims and families from obtaining that justice and accountability. Trump invited members of a group I belong to, 9-11 Justice, to the White House on September 11th, 2019. And as Brett mentioned, he looked them in the eye, shook their hands, and promised that, it, that he would declassify FBI documents related to the 9-11 attacks. 24 hours later, U.S. Attorney General Bill Barr invoked the state secrets privileged preventing those same documents from ever seeing the light of day. This was the first time that the state secret's privilege had ever been invoked in a civil litigation. Thanks to President Joe Biden's executive order signed in September 2021, which declassified a portion of the FBI documents, we now know that 12 Saudi government agency officials aided the hijackers in Los Angeles. Without these facilitators, there was zero chance of 9-11 taking place. These are the FBI's words, not mine. Again, the FBI's words. Why did we have to fight for so long? And still, our fight continues. The 9-11 families have had to grow thick skins over the last 21 years. Those thick skins were tested once again this past summer with the launch of Live Golf. This new golf league is sponsored by Saudi Arabia's Public Investment Fund, <coughs> paying some golfers $100 million to join the tour. In July, Trump hosted a, tour a tournament at his golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey, 50 miles from ground zero in a state that was home to 750 people who were murdered. When asked about the Saudi atrocities, involvement in 9-11, and helping the Saudis sports watch this fact, some golfers stated that they were just trying to provide for their families. Our brother Danny and 2,976 others were just trying to provide for their families on that fateful day as well. During the same golf tournament, when interviewed on ESPN, President Trump stated, well, no one's ever really gotten to the bottom of 9-11. He knows better than anyone about the Saudi government involvement in 9-11. He blamed them on Fox and Friends while running for president in 2016. The cruelty and the callousness of these golfers and a former president is shocking 
and beyond painful. The former president will be hosting other Saudi-backed tournaments at his clubs in Miami and the Bronx, even closer to ground zero than Bedminster. Last week's tournament was in Boston, where the planes took off from Logan Airport. Where the, the planes took off from. Where, where's the next tournament going to take place? Shanksville, Pennsylvania? This abuse has to stop. It's like they're mocking us, the 9-11 community. If the American golfers and a former president don't want to stand up for the 9-11 families and their fight for justice and accountability, I wish they would at least stand up for their fellow citizens that had to decide whether they should jump from the 100th floor or burn alive, or for their fellow citizens on those hijacked planes that had to call their loved ones to say their final goodbyes. Stand up for them. We were all attacked on 9-11. Saudi Arabia is an ally, a quote-unquote strategic partner to the United States. We know they were responsible for the murder of 3,000 innocent Americans, the murder of our Navy servicemen in Pensacola, Florida, the murder of 15-year-old Fallon Smart in Portland, Oregon, and the murder and dismemberment of a Washington Post reporter. They have not been held accountable for any of these crimes. No U.S. ally or strategic partner should have carte blanche to murder innocent Americans and not be held accountable just because they have oil and buy weapons. I am a member of 9-11 Justice. We represent a grassroots movement made up of the 9-11 community. This same 9-11 community has successfully worked with Congress to override the presidential veto of Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, JASTA. Now law, JASTA stripped terrorist nations of immunity. We continue to educate the public, professional golfers, general managers of golf clubs, and politicians, both current and former, on the Saudi government role in 9-11. We are grateful to President Biden for keeping his campaign promise to declassify the 9-11 documents. With President Biden's continued support, he has an opportunity to help us finally achieve justice and become the hero the 9-11 community has been waiting for all these years. Mayor Adams and the New York City government also have that same opportunity. We are also grateful to Senator Schumer, Senator Gillibrand, Senator Blumenthal, and Senator Menendez, and also Congressman Jerry Nadler for their unwavering support for the 9-11 community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. McGinley. Next up, we'll call uh, Ronald Lieberman from the Trump Organization. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the City Council. My name is Ron Lieberman, and I'm an executive vice president for the Trump Organization. I'm here today to provide testimony regarding the Council's review of Trump's license agreement to operate a public golf course at Ferry Point. And I understand from what I've read in the papers in the days leading up till today that the City Council is holding this hearing to see if there is a way to terminate the contract when, instead, we should be thanked for what we have accomplished for the Bronx in particular and for the city of New York as a whole. I have been the lead person with this project for our company and I've been involved with it ever since the city asked us to take it over more than a dozen years ago. At that time, the site was a landfill. The project to construct the golf course was languishing. The contractors, the city selected, were ripping off the taxpayers to the tune of millions and millions of dollars. And the golf course, which was basically 50 years in the making, simply could not get built and simply could not get finished. So in 2010, similar to what we did at Woolman Rink in the 1980s, we were asked to take over the project, finish it, and grow in the golf course and construct 
a state-of-the-art clubhouse in return for operating it under a 20-year license agreement. Immediately, we got rid of the contractors and finished the construction of the golf course. We grew it in beautifully and opened it up to rave reviews and tremendous accolades. Year after year since opening, we have taken great pride and spared no expense in ensuring that Ferry Point continues to be recognized as one of the best public golf courses in the world. And the accolades and public comments about our operation fully bear that out. This is primarily due to the magnificent employees that run Ferry Point, literally hundreds of them, some of which are here and are about to testify today, including Brian Kroll, our general manager. In fact, I, I invite all the members of the City Council to come to Ferry Point so you can see for yourself just how beautiful this facility is and how run it is by our employees who take so much pride in what they do every single day. By comparison, and I think one of the council members alluded uh, to it, the same cannot be said about other city concession golf courses where after just one site vi visit, you will find many violations which include horrendous golf course playing conditions. I truly ask each of you to go to Ferry Point and see for yourself what we and our great and talented employees have created for the city of New York. Now, just a few years later, and after we've invested more than $30 million, the City Council is holding this hearing to see if there is a way to terminate this contract. You may recall this issue came up last year when then Mayor de Blasio attempted to terminate our contract and steal this investment from us, all to settle a political vendetta against the former president who is no longer involved with the day-to-day -day operation of our company and has not been for over six years. Ultimately, we were successful in court and the judge ruled that there were no grounds to terminate our contract. There were no grounds then and there are no grounds now. Plain and simple, there are no grounds to terminate our contract. Um, I, those are my written statements, and I'm sure you might have some questions for me, but before I uh, turn it back to you, I just uh, I, I know that there's been a bunch of conversation about the tournament coming up next month, the Aramco tournament, and um, I want to say a few words about that that I didn't prepare. First, I wanted to also say that what Brian Kroll said about 9-11 and the families um, we, as a company, have complete sympathy you know, for the families and for 9-11. And to Brian's point, we do countless events that benefit uh, the families of 9-11, uh, not just at Ferry Point, but at many properties all throughout the Trump portfolio. Uh, we're incredible supporters for the families and will continue to do so. What, what's happening here with Aramco and this event, the first thing that you should know, this is not the first Aramco event. The, same, the very, very same event took place in New York State last year. Same event. But there's been no remarks from either this city council or anyone about that. So what's the difference? The difference is because of Trump. Many companies, dozens of companies, Fortune 500 companies, do business with the Saudi government. It's just part of doing business and the biggest companies in the world, right here in New York. What's the difference? Trump. This event is gonna be a great event for New York City for several reasons. Number one, it's gonna be the very first professional women's golf tournament ever held in New York City. One of, the, one of the, the things that this contract does, that this golf course does, it enables New York City to be the leader in bringing world-class events to New York City. And through, through uh, the leadership at Ferry Point, we're gonna do that, and it's gonna be a great event for women's golf. It's gonna further add women to the map of, of golf in general, empower women, and, and we think once this event is said and done, People are going to be thanking us for bringing it here. I welcome any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, my first question, Mr. Liebman, is what exactly is your, is your role, your title, and your role at the Trump Organization? Uh, I'm an exec executive vice president. Mm -hmm. And what are your responsibilities? Uh, a number of them, including uh, oversight of, of golf, 
and uh, insurance and, uh, and other matters with the company. Now, can you tell me who from this mayoral administration approved the permit for the Aramco Team Series event in October? The event was approved, uh, but what I would suggest of the City Council is, why don't you ask the City? It was indeed approved, right. and it was approved by Parks. You should ask Parks. But you're here, uh, and so we're asking you, and presumably you were and involved in the conversation. Yes, and I'm telling you that it was, it was indeed improved in writing, as uh, I think the lawyer that was here stated needed to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been ver working very closely um, you know, with, with Parks leading up, up to the event, ensuring that we're, we're going to put together a very successful event. But why don't you ask Parks about, you know, specifically the, the, you know, the, the person that, that, that had approved that. And have you seen the written contract that was uh, granting approval of this tournament? Yes. And who signed that contract? I'm not going to get into that. Do you know again, uh, again, yes, but I'm going to ask you to then to go to Parks uh, and ask them. And who did you meet with uh, at the Parks Department and at City Hall in the approval of this contract? Um, again, I'm not going to get into specific names. If you're interested in those people from the city, you should ask them. So the city has all the records and documents of who, who you met with, but you did have meetings with City Hall? Is that correct? I, I, I don't speak for other people of what they may or may not have, but I would suggest you talk to them. What I'm asking is, is it correct that you had meetings with City Hall? Were you personally in, the, in those meetings? Say that one more time, please. Were you personally in meetings with City Hall leading up to the approval? I was not the personally in meetings with City Hall. So you yourself never met with City Hall on behalf of the Trump Organization for the approval of this golf tournament? I did not. Who did from the Trump Organization? I'm not aware of anyone. You're not aware of anyone? Our relationship is with the New York City Parks Department because we hold the license agreement with them. So your testimony is that no one from the Trump Organization met with City Hall uh, leading up to the approval of this golf tournament? Not, not that I'm aware of. So who, who did the Trump Organization... A again, it, again, just to repeat, our contract is with the New York City Parks Department, mm -hmm. the entity that, over, that has you know, ownership of it because it's in a park. Mm -hmm. And so who on behalf of the Trump Organization met with the Parks Department for the approval of this tournament? Uh, it, a number of people because there were a number of you know, issues leading up to it, mm -hmm. um, including myself. And who did you meet with at the Parks Department? Again, I'm, you, should, you should ask them. But these were meetings that you were in, correct? Or phone calls. Mm -hmm. And do you know which levels of the Parks Department uh, you were meeting with? Yes, I know who I met with, but uh, again, why, why don't you talk to them about that? Mm -hmm. And what kind of logistics has the city been uh, working with you on in the approval and the planning for this tournament? Can you go through? Eric Trump, your principal, has named here again that there were, not only in addition to approvals, logistics um, and parking and other things like that that the city has done in terms of working with you on the planning for this tournament. What kinds of things are there? Well, what would be typical of, uh, you know, a professional golf tournament, right? So you, you, you anticipate having fans there. So logistics, I think Brian mentioned it, involving parking, setup, staging, you know, the things that would typically go into putting together, you know, a professional event. And so what decisions have City Hall or the Parks Department been working with you to plan for this tournament? What decisions have come up that they've uh, helped? Again, you I, I, you know, I, I haven't been in all the, all the meetings, as Brian, Brian had mentioned. You know, there's a tournament director who takes lead on you know, operational meetings, and there's coordination between that group uh, and, and the city uh, on logistics. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the goal is you know, what needs to happen to put together an incredible event for New York City. And I could tell you, that from what I understand from these meetings, um, we're going to have a great event, and the, the goal being to, to have a, an event that's safe, enjoyable, and fun for everybody, and I have no doubt that that's what's going to happen. And you're aware of the 9-11 family's opposition to this event, right, given the painful memories that it evokes? Well, I've heard, we've heard about it recently, and again, it's just kind of curious to us because the event, the very same event took place in New York last year, very same event. Uh, and as I mentioned too, you know, we total sympathy for the 9-11 families and we contribute you know in many ways you know to the to that cause Com very sympathetic to it no, like like all New Yorkers we're all New Yorkers so we're we're all sympathetic to that but again we you know we we have an obligation you know this is a business right and and part of our, our contract one of the goals of the contract is to to do this to do this very thing to bring a professional tournament that's you know a, a one of the goals mm -hmm. 
And that would be your response to 9-11 families who have grave concerns about oh, well, My response to 9-11 families and it would, would be that we, we're, 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 we're in this with you. We're, you know, we support you, and we continue to do so in any way possible, and we have specifically done so right here in New York at Ferry Point. Mm -hmm. And you think that hosting this tournament uh, meets that objective, too, despite their opposition? You know, uh, again, it's, you know, they're, they're, you're being selective because, you know, like, as I mentioned before, you know, dozens and dozens of Fortune 500 companies work, work with the, you know, the, the same entity that ultimately is involved, and we're, we're aligned with that, right? Um, so you, you just can't be selective and cherry-pick at it like that. Mm -hmm. And are you aware that Alan Weisselberg, the CFO of the Trump Organization, uh, has pleaded guilty to grand larceny and tax fraud? crimes committed during his time as CFO of your organization? Yes, I'm aware. Are you aware uh, that uh, Donald Trump, the guarantor of this license, is facing numerous civil and criminal uh, investigations at every level of government? I can't even comment on that. I, uh, there's yeah, constant... You're aware you're not aware. Well, I'm aware. Yeah. Um, and are you aware that your accounting firm at the time, Mazars, retracted its certification for the financial records that it reviewed? I'm not aware of what specifically. I'm not. I'm not involved in anything related to Mazur, so I can't speak to exactly what they did or, or did not agree to retract. Were you involved in negotiations of this license? Yes. Yeah. And so, as part of the negotiations, you're aware that Mazars had provided financial certifications uh, that the Parks Department relied on, right? Or we did. Uh, I mean, I can't, again, this is something, you know, if you go back, this is, you know, 12, 15 years ago, so I can't speak directly to what, you know, was provided, you know, at that time. Mm -hmm. So you were involved in negotiations of the license, but you're not aware that Mazars, the accounting firm that did the certification? Well, Ma Mazars was our accounting firm, finish, but I can't. Let me finish the question. I'm sorry. You were involved with the negotiations of the license, but you're not aware that Mazars was retracted its certifications for this time period? I don't know what, again, I'm not involved in how, what Mazur said or did, and again, that you could refer back to them, mm -hmm. but I could tell you that I was involved in the agreement and, and the negotiations, as were many, by the way. I was one of, you know, a number of people, uh, you know, including uh, lawyers and other executives that were involved in, in negotiating the agreement. And you do know that the Mazar's retraction of their financial certifications for the 10-year period was public news that came out as a result of the investigations, right? Were you aware of that? I'm not aware. I don't know. I, I don't read every single thing that comes out about this. Okay. It seems pretty big as an yeah. accounting firm, right, yeah. the certifications. Um, how much would you claim you invested in the property to improve it? I don't, again, I don't have the specific numbers on it, but I could tell you, and I, I heard what, what that lawyer had said, that we're, we're well in excess of $30 million in terms of investment between growing costs, capital investment, et cetera, on number. I don't know what he was talking about with this five, $10 million number. It's completely out of whack. We have all the numbers, and it's, it's, it's in excess. It's far in excess of $30 million. Mm -hmm. And you're aware that the license agreement, which you helped to negotiate, estimated of an investment uh, of less than $15 million, closer to $10 million. Well, it depends on what, you, you know, you, you're cherry picking because that, you, you, you have a capital investment, you have a growing cost, they're two different, yeah. two different things. I'm, I'm talking about both of those, the capital yeah. improvement cost and the growing cost. Are you aware that you are projected in the range of roughly 10 to $15 million max investment? No, it's, it's more than that. And, and it was all agreed to with the city and the city has the records of it. It's way more than that. Did you know that was an Exhibit K of the license, uh, that the max capital improvement and growing costs were to be about 10 to 15 million? I don't know, like to your words, it was an estimate. Mm -hmm. And do you routinely build projects over budgeted by two to three times what the projection is? Well, we build, obviously there's, there's budgets for everything, but we build to deliver an incredible product, you know, and we do what it takes and the numbers take care of themselves, right? So. In my testimony, I mentioned about going to Ferry Point. I would suggest you go to Ferry Point. I'll, I'll be happy to host you, right? No, thank you. But okay, yeah. I knew you'd say no. But come, see for yourself what we did. And we spare no expense because that's our brand. And, and, and you'll see it there, and you'll see it at any Trump property across the world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I would assume, I know you're not involved in the construction and manager side, but as a VP that oversees the, cons right. the operations of the Trump Organization, I would assume you consider yourself a responsible um, uh, 
executive over a managerial and development decision of properties, right? One of several people. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think that it's customary, assuming that your goal, which I think it is, um, is to make a profit off the course too, do you think you'd be able to do that if the, project, if the actual cost of development and construction exceeded two to three times what the projection was? Yeah, again, I don't know where this two to three times number that you keep saying, it's not two to three times whatever a projection is, but you know, it's pretty common for budgets to go over because there are things that come about throughout the construction that are unanticipated. And uh, again, we have a brand to adhere to, and so we're gonna spend what we need to to make it beautiful mm -hmm. and uh, uh, as I mentioned, just go there and you'll yeah. see it for yourself. But let's let's put aside yeah. what's in the license. I think it's clear, right. but let's put that aside. Is it common to go over projected costs at two to three times what you'd expect? Um, and again, you keep bringing up, I don't know where this two to three times. Thing, generally speaking, put aside where it comes from. Is it common in your work that when you project a budget that you go over those costs by two to three times? It, it's, it definitely could be common to go over uh, because you're, you're, you're working on something that's an estimate. Mm -hmm. um, I can't comment on whether, you know, that's two times, one time, three times, five times. You know, it depends what happens during the construction. Mm -hmm. And this is... Yeah, I can tell you, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. You know, we, you know, when we were going through the construction phase, you know, we were, we were not satisfied. We, we had a number of architects that we were looking at in designing our main obligation, which was that clubhouse, and we weren't satisfied. And so... We, we went through a number of rounds before we ultimately landed on the team, you know, that would do this. Uh, you know, all that cost that would probably were in excess of, of where it was originally. And this is a public golf course, right? Absolutely. Do you consider uh, $200 for a round of golf affordable uh, to the residents of the Bronx? Uh, first of all, uh, I heard you mention that question before. Many of our users are from the Bronx, by the way, uh, including all, all, and all five boroughs of New York City. Uh, the majority of our golfers are residents of New York, New York City, and uh, as Brian had mentioned, we have a whole uh, schedule of fees depending on whether they're a junior, a senior, whether they're playing on the weekend, the weekday, so it varies. So if you want to pick at the highest rate, no matter what rate you pick, I view it as an incredible bargain uh, for anyone who uses it, and you don't even have to ask me, just ask the golfers, and it's reflected year after year in the number of people that go there, including many residents from the Bronx, and there's a reason they go there. It's a bargain. Mm -hmm. So it's a bargain. It's a bargain, That's yeah. It's a bargain for what they're getting in, in return, and largely because of what we've accomplished there and what the staff has accomplished and delivers in terms of service there. And my last question for you is, do you support the decision to have the golf tournament next point uh, at Ferry Point Park? Yeah. Thank you for your testimony. Okay, thank you. Now we'll call as the next witness, uh, Tim Froelich. Sorry, guys, I'm just getting myself situated here. Sure. Um, good afternoon now. Um, my name is Tim Froelich, and I was a survivor of the collapse of the South Tower uh, 21 years ago this week. Um, I was working on the 80th floor for a Japanese bank at the time. After the North Tower was attacked, my coworker and I, um, who happened to be my best friend, went to the 81st and the 82nd floor. Uh, to advise other employees to start their descent down to lower floors. Sadly, some of those coworkers elected to stay. After entering stairwell A, we began making the long ascent down to exit the South Tower. At around floor number 60, amidst collapsing tiles, smoke, and debris, I was separated from my friend. Sadly, I never saw him again, and he never made it out. Once I reached the lobby, I exited the building and was getting my eyes rinsed by a rescue worker when I was told, with my back to the building now, sir, you need to run. Behind me, I heard a tremendous roar. I saw hundreds of people running up Fulton Street. 
I was consumed by the black dust cloud and the collapse of the South Tower as I was actually preparing myself to perish. Fortunately, somehow, an arm came out of the darkness and I was pulled off my feet, falling down a flight of stairs in the parking garage at the Millennium Hotel. As I fell, I snapped, crushed, and granulated, as the doctors described it, my left ankle and my left foot, leaving me with a marked deformity and a permanent disability. New York City firefighter told me he would be back as I laid in that uh, stairwell. It felt like hours, and after a while, he did come back. One of the individuals he brought back was, <coughs> Captain, was Captain Kathy Mazza, from the Port Authority Police Department. Kathy told me, you're going home t tonight, sir. Being about five foot three with a distinguishable ponytail, Kathy lifted me from the stairwell and carried me to a Chase Man Manhattan Bank lobby where I received aid. She was then out the door of that lobby heading to help more victims. Kathy Mazza was killed in the collapse of the North Tower shortly after helping me enter my ambulance parked on Fulton Street. Without her heroics, I would not be here to testify today. But that's enough about me. It's been 21 years since almost 3,000 innocent people lost their lives and thousands of others have now died due to the interim exposure and the debris of those collapsing buildings. Even though the 19 terrorists died that day, Osama bin Laden, and others have also been captured and killed, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has never been brought to justice and has never admitted its guilt. And further, it has never compensated the victims or the support to the Al-Qaeda and the 9-11 plot. How do we know Saudi Arabia did it? Because for 20 years, representatives of the 9-11 families and survivors have been digging, investigating, and questioning. We've been blocked by obstruction. We've been blocked by delay from our own government, as well as certainly the Saudi government. But finally, last year, President Joe Biden issued Executive Order 14040, ordering a declassification review, which resulted in the public release of 4,000 FBI documents. Many of those documents are from the FBI investigation, as, as Brett had said, known as Operation Encore. Operation Encore ran from 2006 until last year. Operation Encore fo focused specifically on the role of Saudi government officials it, who were in the United States in support of the 9-11 plot. Operation Encore was intended as an intelligence gathering operation, not a criminal investigation. And therefore, there has not been any indictments, convictions for anyone regarding the 9-11 attacks. I've attached to this statement some excerpts from the publicly available FBI Encore documents. Here are two brief packages. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an example of one document that was given to the families and is now can be found on 911justice.org. It is a Operation Encore document, an FBI released. Now, I, I want to remind everyone, these documents never came out until last year. They were released under the Biden executive order. So as far as Fortune 500 companies doing business with Saudi Arabia, my best guess would be that Fortune 500 companies have not read these documents. They're new. They just came out. I want to refer to a couple of passages. This is not my words. Once again, this is an official FBI document. And this is what the FBI wrote. Operation Encore is an investigation into individuals known to have provided substantial 9-11 assistance to two hijackers, hijacker Al-Hazami and Khalid Al-Midar, 
during their time in California prior to the attacks. Operation Encore main subjects include the following people. And these people that I'm going to mention were paid Saudi government officials. They were working for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The first individual is Fahad al-Thumari. Next, Omar al-Bayoumi. And finally, the third individual here is Musad al-Jara. Once again, Saudi government officials being paid by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. These subjects, according to the FBI, provided or directed others to provide the hijackers with assistance in daily activities, including procuring living quarters, financial assistance, assistance in obtaining flight lessons, as well as driver's licenses. Operation Encore seeks to prove that these individuals provided assistance with the knowledge that Al-Hazami and Midar, who were the two terrorist hijackers on Flight 77, were here to commit an act of terrorism. That to me is pretty damning and pretty significant. And again, that's not me saying it, that's our own FBI. There should be no one in any context of any business taking any money from Saudi Arabia, least of all a former president to host a golf tournament this close to Manhattan or anywhere in the country. These facts need to be out and we all need to be reminded of the fact that we now have an ex-president and an organization doing business with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This is not about Trump anymore. This is about FBI documents. Documents that prove that the ex-president has now made a conscious decision to turn his back on the 9-11 community, to turn his back on New York, and in essence, turn his back on the country and take money and support a golf tournament at a public, at, I'm sorry, at a public uh, golf course so as everyone makes money here. That's what this is about. And it's reprehensible. I have several other documents. Again, all FBI, all FBI related. Fahad al-Thumari was a Saudi diplomat. He was assigned to an embassy in Washington, D.C., the Saudi embassy, as well as the Saudi consulate, also located in Los Angeles. Al-Thumari was a representative of the Ministry of Islamic Affairs. And what we know is that the Ministry of Islamic Affairs parallels our State Department. So in essence, they are the government. FBI queries were of interest to the highest levels of the Saudi government. So here again is more proof that we have people that were here, 12 to 13 people, beginning in 1999, well in advance of the reception of the hijackers who never came to this country until January in the year 2000. So there was a group of people to receive the hijackers and then the hijackers arrived. And it is relevant to say that, as has been reported, it's accurate, 15 of the 19 hijackers were in fact Saudi nationals. But the point to be made here is there are individuals now in FBI documents that were Saudi government employees. They were here long before the hijackers arrived in 2000. And we can prove it. It's right here. Now, on September 11th, 2019, I was fortunate also to be in a group with 9-11 family members and survivors who went to the White House 
to meet with President Trump. We were seeking his help to get these documents released in 2019. The president looked me in the eyes and said, yes, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help the families. The next day, as Brett had said, his administration declared these same documents a state secret, basically saying, I have them, you can't have them. As we now know, those documents, thanks to President Biden, we've received those documents thanks to President Biden. President Trump lied to us, and we know why. Just like this, Saudi money. He's in business with the Saudis. The Aramco tournament scheduled for October 13th at Trump's golf course in the Bronx is a tragedy. It is a throat punch to every single New York City resident, every single person in this country. It should not take place, and this can be stopped, and it needs to be stopped. Once again, I wanna, I wanna make the point, this is not about Trump, this is about facts, ladies and gentlemen. We have the facts now. This is about who he has elected to do business with. A foreign country came to this country and killed 3,000 people, and that's not okay. And now, President Trump, just three short years ago, said, I'm going to help you, and what happened? We got nothing. He didn't do anything. He knew these documents existed, and now, now we're very quickly approaching a golf tournament in the city and it's okay for him to turn around and do business with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia who sponsored these attacks? That's outrageous. That's outrageous. That's reprehensible. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Folick, for your, for your testimony. Um, and I do hope, um, as you call too, that the uh, Parks Department, the Parks Commissioner will terminate this license yes, um, you know, and cancel the golf tournament. One other thing, I'm hopeful. I, uh, just because other people waiting, waiting to testify no problem. too. So I, just one other quick thing. I'm hopeful that as a city, just like after 9-11, we can come together, government, city agencies, and we can get this quashed. I, I really am very hopeful. After 9-11, there was a tremendous amount of unity here throughout the country, and we need that unity again to have to not only have justice, but to also have this quashed and killed. So that way, none of this happens. We need to cut off the relationship that we have with this kingdom who came here and murdered 3,000 people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Froelich. Uh Next up, we're gonna call uh, Edward Perez. Edward Perez here? No. Um, let's see. Paul Mutze? Okay. Uh, Paul Mutze? Paul Francis Mutze? Hi, thank you. You may begin. Sure. My name is Paul Mutzi. I am the golf outing coordinator at Trump Golf Links at Ferry Point. Um, I am very proud, proud Bronx native. Uh, I think the organization has done a great job at bringing public golf to New York City. And I think it's a great thing. We do have a lot of wonderful employees over there who also live in the Bronx. It's, uh, it's a crucial part of their daily lives. Uh, also their livelihoods. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next we'll call uh, Daniel Tenga. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I just have a few things I want to say about the day-to-day -day operations at uh, Trump Golf Links at Ferry Point. Uh, my name is Daniel Tenga. I am the assistant golf professional at Trump Golf Links at Ferry Point, and I oversee the golf shop 
operations there. Um, Trump Golf Links has become a staple to the city of New York City and the community of Throgs Neck. The organization has generally employed people that are residents of New York City part-time and full-time. I have lived in Throgs Neck my entire life and Trump, Trump Golf Links has became a main attraction for our community. Um, there's always been a rave about the organization and about the property, the golf course, the food, the view, et cetera. Before I was full-time at the Trump Organization, um, I worked at Pelham Split Rock, which was an American golf corporation company who run, five, who run seven other golf courses in New York City. Um, to attempt to compare Trump Golf Links to American Golf Corporation is uncomparable. Um, the food, food and beverage aspect, the course conditions, et cetera, um, there is no comparison there. Um, there's a few things I want to touch on as well. Um, we may have mi mixed up some of the rates. Um, Trump Golf Links cost $162 during the week for a resident and $195 um, during the weekend, while American Golf will charge you $82.14 plus a $4 parking fee. Also, we offer a completely different aspect. We offer uh, food and beverages basically on every other hole, where if you go to another city public golf course, it's impossible to get a water. Um, we, we have a completely different aspect of customer service. Um, you'll walk in, you'll walk at our clubhouse and you'll see a difference automatically off the bat. Um, you will not see that at any other New York City public golf course. Um, and that's all I have right now, if you have any questions. Thanks so much for your testimony. You got it. Next we'll call up uh, Yanina Perez. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Janina Perez, and I work at Trump Ferry Point. Um, what I want to say is that um, I live in the neighborhood uh, for many years, and I saw uh, Trump Ferry Point being built, and I used to wonder what it was going to be. And I, I used to drive by, run by, exercise around there, and I used to ask myself, who can afford to belong to this club? What kind of people are gonna be coming here? And I used to say, I'm sure there is fancy people working there, must be very expensive. I wonder how much they pay for membership to play golf. And then I heard from neighbors and friends that it was not a membership club, it was not even a club, it was a golf course, and that it was open to the public. And that made me um, drive by again and go in the parking lot and see what it was about. And I saw that everybody that works there, most people are people from the neighborhood. Um, we hire, um, young people for the summer. We hire older people for the season. I am very happy to be working there. A couple of weeks ago, um, they hired someone new and this lady asked me if I was, if I liked working there. And I say, yes, I love it here. I enjoy it here. I'm very happy here. And I want to retire from here. So I do hope that we stay open forever, for as long as we have to. And I'm not only speaking for myself, there's about 150 more employees, 150 more families that right now are in the Bronx working at Ferry Point. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, Ms. Perez. Uh, now, finally, we have Liz Sanchez. My name is Liz Sanchez, and I, I was there in 9-11. I worked at uh, 27 Maiden Lane, not too far from there, in the 27th floor. I remember clearly how everything happened. I was stuck in the office for two days because we were not sure if we could go anywhere or go home or how to get home. Um, 
I remember the screams, the smells, everything, everything. I lost a family member. I lost good friends and coworkers that day. It was a horrible day that I will never forget. But it was 21 years since it happened, and I have moved on. 21 years, it's a long time. I lost my father two years ago due to COVID. So should I sue the city for not doing what they need to do? No, because it's part, it happened. And I just move on. Now I work for Trump, Ferry Point. I'm in the, I work in the accounting department. I can tell you that everything we do is by the books. And I love working there, along with 170 to 190 people that we hire to work at Trump Ferry Point every season. And these employees, 85% of them live in the Bronx. I live in the Bronx. I'm five minutes away from there. The families that live in the Bronx that depend on this license to continue to work there. Also, the customers, the, the, our golf course are well taken care of. Management does an amazing job. Now you say Donald Trump is on investigation, but he is not found guilty yet. You're judging on something that you don't know what's gonna happen. You can't put two things together. Our, our facility and his personal is two different entities. We work there, we maintain it, we love it. We have so many families that depend on this. You are basically just don't like him and you judge and you just wanna cancel because you decided on what you see or what you hear and you don't agree with him or whatever the reason is. But you have to think that in that facility, in Trump Ferry Point, there are people that we need this job. Thank you. That concludes our hearing for today on the Committee on Parks and Recreation. Uh, I would just conclude by saying we've laid out today numerous paths by which the Parks Commissioner can terminate this license, uh, and we would urge uh, both uh, the Parks Commissioner and City Hall to do so immediately and to cancel this golf tournament. The license is as clear as day um, how it can be done, as is the very fact from a moral, legal, and ethical standpoint that public parkland should not be in the hands of Donald Trump or the Trump Organization. Uh, they have shown themselves unworthy of it. Uh, at this point, I'd like to also uh, say a big thank you uh, to the Parks Committee, uh, to Chris, uh, Patrick, Shima, Rose, uh, Nick, uh, for all their hard work for today's hearing, uh, to my staff as well, um, to Chuck, to Kevin, to Greg, um, and everyone who had made today's hearing a success. Uh, thank you all so much for attending. Uh, this hearing is now closed.